Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our October case conference. So I'm Tua Pal. I lead I Care. I just wanted to go through some housekeeping sorts of items first. Uh, just we appreciate the referrals to our Inherited Cancer Registry, which can be done either via our website directly or through prepaid postcards is that we're happy to provide you, uh, just let us know. And then as well, relevant to case conference, please submit cases for case conference. Again, we appreciate all of our eye care partners that have submitted cases. It does definitely provide for more engagement and uh, stimulating discussion. So, and we've tried to make it as easy as possible. There is a link on our website to submit cases directly. Uh, again, just a highlight of some of the resources that are provided through iCare. Uh, we have these monthly virtual case conferences. We have our newsletter that we um, develop twice a year. Uh, we have a lot of these um, resources on our website, including prior uh, listing of prior talks with links to them, as well as our prior newsletters as well as our social media posts. Again, all housed on our website, which are searchable. And then uh, again, we are active on social media. And here are just some examples of our postings over the last month on social media. There have been many, many more, but just to highlight talks that are available, newsletters, uh, studies that may be relevant for individuals with hereditary cancer, um, educational stories, research updates, as well as guideline updates. Uh, again, some eye care focused efforts. We have, uh, we're still recruiting actively for our impact study to test strategies for both cancer risk management uh, or guideline adherent cancer risk management, as well as family communication in those with inherited cancer gene mutations. The segue into this trial is through iCare, so please continue to uh, refer to iCare. Um, additionally, we are continuing our uh, study looking at genomically characterizing breast cancers in individuals with hereditary forms of breast cancer, uh, due to BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, ATM, and CHECK2. We have some interesting results. We're starting to generate some interesting results. We will be presenting um, some of our initial findings at the upcoming American Society of Human Genetics meeting. And again, we appreciate all the referrals to eye care to support this study. Uh, just a few other um, upcoming conferences. There is a conference being hosted through the Women's College Group in Toronto in honor of a 30-year discovery of the BRCA genes, also in honor of Dr. Stephen Nayrod. There is a researcher and healthcare provider focused event on November 4th that I will also be speaking at, along with many um, former mentees of Dr. Stephen Nayrod. And then there is a patient in public focused uh, event on November 5th. Um, again, both of these are available both in person as well as um, through a uh, webinar. And then we have been hosting uh, patient forums. Our next one is at the end of October, focused on hereditary can um, breast cancers in men in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we have a really um, great panel of speakers and panelists lined up, including our Cancer Center Director, who is a medical oncologist, Dr. Ben Park, uh, with a focus on male breast cancers, as well as co-founders of the His, His Breast Cancer Awareness um, Foundation, Harvey Singer and Vicki Wolf, who are both BRCA2 carriers. And then our uh, looking ahead, the Montreal Proprietary Breast and Ovarian Cancer Symposium, excuse me, will be happening 
in May of 2025. As you all may know, this is a biannual conference, so it happens every two years, hosted by Dr. Will Fawkes and um, additional um, individuals that uh, uh, are involved. And again, it's on May 6th to 9th. It's a really phenomenal conference. Will brings in a lot of uh, speakers that are leaders in the field. Um, for anyone interested in submitting an abstract for consideration of uh, orals, it's December 2nd, and then poster. Um, if you just interested in posters is January 13th. So again, um, this is just something that's that happens every two years. Uh, last thing I wanted to highlight, we just released our fall 2024 eye care newsletter, which is also available on our website. So you can go to inheritedcancer.net and the newsletter is there. Very quick updates. We um, summarize some of the NCCN updates in the genetics panels, both the uh, breast, ovarian, pancreatic cancer panel, as well as the col colorectal, endometrial, and gastric cancer panel. So there are two genetics panels. Both the newsletter update uh, provided some updates relevant to both. Um, there was also additional guideline updates that have more recently been released through ASCO. And then um, some articles focused on cancer risks that were highlighted, including, you know, one of the things that has been getting more attention, check to by allelics, um, BRCA2 prostate, associated prostate cancers, et cetera. And then obviously some treatment updates, including, you know, uh, more recent studies that have been published focused on BRCA carriers and PARP treatment, as well as a um, new study focused on pancreatic cancer screening. And then for the community spotlight, we had my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Marlia Kritzel, uh, provide a write-up where she also kind of went through what some of her big picture life lessons were. So I encourage you all to uh, check that out if of interest. So with that, I'm gonna go into the first case. So here's the patient history. Uh, the reason for referral was a breast cancer patient completed treatment and had a BRCA2 mutation. So this was someone that came to our, our clinic already with a BRCA2 mutation identified. Uh, she'd had breast cancer diagnosed at age 46, which was ER positive, PR negative, HER2 equivocal, treated with subtotal mastectomy, chemo and radiation, and uh, genetic testing through, through her oncologist in Kentucky through Myriad showed this result. So BRCA2, C9699 underscore 9702 del. She had a risk-reducing salpingoophorectomy in May of 2021 and is currently receiving high-risk breast screening. So you see here her family or her personal and family history. Personal history, she had the breast cancer. But again, when we're looking beyond this, there wasn't many other um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer related um, cancers in the family. So this was the genetic test result, uh, again, that I've already highlighted. Now, here is um, an article that I'd pulled up with um, evidence for pathogenicity. So we have here the second listing here, which again says mutation concurrence um, indeterminate does not, so, so there are some elements of this uh, variant that don't support pathogenicity. Now, here's the thing, mother also um, got tested. Uh, she's a 72 year old female, no personal history of cancer, and she self-referred um, for testing after she accompanied her daughter to the visit with me. Um, she had tried to get testing through her PCP, 
um, but was told Medicare wouldn't cover it and it would be $12,000. Um, the family history, again, you can see here, leukemia in some of her sisters, later onset colon cancer in her mom. Um, so again, she has this variant. Her sisters are in Germany. So again, wasn't super feasible in terms of figuring out how they could get tested. But again, we gave them the tools we were aware of. Um, again, this is going through evidence for pathogenicity. And again, I think this is one of those variants that is that may be associated in the biallelic state with Fanconi anemia. So again, there was some verbiage in here. I'm not gonna go through this in a great amount of detail, but supporting, bottom line supporting um, this potentially being a hypomorphic variant. So again, um, I reached out to some of the labs. Um, bottom line was this may be a hypomorphic variant, so a reduced penetrance variant. RNA, from what I gathered from my discussions with a couple of the labs, uh, will not help. There are 28 entries in ClinVar classified as likely pathogenic. This, I just pulled uh, the ClinVar entry. And what I also found interesting here is that when you actually look below, um, there are labs that report this as a VUS. So I was a little surprised that it didn't say conflicting interpretation. Um, but again, I think this gets into penetrance versus pathogenicity. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. I also wanted to acknowledge that my friend and colleague, Dr. Alvaro Montero, was the one who was supposed to be giving our session today uh, with the hurricane that hit la uh, yesterday in Florida. Uh, I, I don't think Alvaro has power, so I'm going to get him rescheduled for 2025. He'd give me a heads up already that he may not be able to make it. But again, our thoughts are with all of our friends and colleagues and family in Florida. But I just wanted to acknowledge that Again, I was really thrilled to have Alvaro present because he does such a phenomenal job and he's been with eye care from the beginning, but um, we will get him rescheduled. So I'll be the one giving the presentation, but I just wanted to uh, open it up for any questions anyone might have. And then I'll go into my presentation, which again, I've been working with uh, Dr. Montero as well as Dr. Couch and others on this topic. So I'll kind of provide my insight. Any questions? Okay, I am going to move on because I don't see anything in the chat. So going into BRCA1 and BRCA2, very big picture wise, we know like when we're talking about hereditary breast cancer genes, there have been two large efforts that um, were reported on back in 2021, the what we call the Bridges study, which is um, a study of over 100,000 women from 25 countries, and then the Carrier study, which is a group of 64,000 women that were US-based. That's the one that's led by uh, Dr. Fergus Couch, Kate, Na Kate Nathanson, and others. So what was found in these studies were specific genes that we were able to confirm, hey, these are um, associated with higher risk for breast cancer. Now, when we're talking about high risk guidelines, again, I like to point this out. Um, these were released back in 20, uh, 2007 by the American Cancer Society. And really, this 20 to 25% threshold is has was released almost two decades ago. And what they said at the time was have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of about 20 to 25% or greater. So again, I do think it is time to really think about, well, what was this based on? And again, subsequent studies have shown that 
five-year risks are more accurate than lifetime risks, especially for younger women. So again, just highlighting that age distribution when we're thinking about risk really does matter and what the risk is over the next five to 10 years versus lifetime, which is what we often only have or what we are really using when we're thinking about um, what guidelines are telling us. Now, there are many risk factors that we also know that go into breast cancer risk, including the things that are modifiable as well as unmodifiable. So taking all that into account, the develop, um, there's a program that's been developed based on the Bodicea back, um, backbone called CanRisk that was developed by Dr. Antonis Antonio, who will be our speaker during our next case conference in November. Now, what this CanRisk program takes into account is a lot of our hormonal and other risk factor information, as well as the gene mutation. And with that information, um, we can then generate a risk. But again, keeping in mind that the risk that's generated is a specific number. So again, as stated by a famous statistician from the UK, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So I think of this as a useful guide when I am generating these risk assessments for patients. So again, as part of the CAN risk model, we can include information on polygenic risk scores. But again, what we know, and really all this, all I'm trying to say with this slide is that most of our data uh, pertaining to genomic studies have been done in whites who represent about 16% of the world population. And this matters because predictions are less accurate in non-white populations. I think there are focus strategies to fix this, but that is still an issue. And then when we're thinking of polygenic risk scores, again, important to think about spread of risk. So if we have uh, mutations in a specific gene and we overlay polygenic risk scores, we can actually spread out the risk to either further raise the risk or lower the risk. And again, it doesn't matter as much for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, but uh, specifically with mutations that are penetrant, so we're not talking about the hypomorphs. However, it does matter for genes like PALB2 where we can kind of toggle between high penetrance versus moderate penetrance. And then especially for check two and ATM, where we can, again, toggle between lower risk, lower increased risk versus moderate risk. And then all this to say, ascertainment certainly matters as well. When we have a clinic-based sample, we tend to have higher risks that are seen versus population-based samples where you have a group of unselected um, individuals where the risks tend to be um, lower. So ascertainment certainly does matter. Now, when we're thinking about variant classification, our usual way of thinking about this is we have a benign or a negative, a pathogenic, a positive, or a VUS result. So usually three results. But what we're working towards nowadays, in my mind, is almost thinking of it as you know, a negative, a positive VUS, but adding in this intermediate positive. So again, as we're learning more about these pathogenic variants, important to think about pathogenicity versus penetrance, and some of these intermediate risk uh, variants are important to take into consideration. And this is a framework that has been considered um, through national organizations like NS, um, ACMG that have put forth some um, additional uh, guidance. Now, when we're thinking about BRCA hypomorphs, it really isn't a new concept. This R1699Q variant back in 2012 was reported to be of uh, 
a lower risk. You can see here the line with the triangles. And then subsequently with a reanalysis, this finding definitely held true with uh, what you see in the um, blue, uh, blue line. So as many of you may have noticed, this is actually included in the most current version or the current version of the NCCM guidelines where we have now added this specific variant as an example. And I think there will be more where it's about a 24% risk um, and care should be individualized based on personal and family history because with a 24% risk, we think of it more in the moderate penetrance range, which again, has implications to patient care. And when we're thinking about BRCA2 hypomorphs, again, there have been functional studies looking at multiple modalities, but what I wanted to point out here is it's not just positive versus negative. There are ones with a mild effect, um, moderate effect. So it's almost this continuum of risk that's that exists rather than saying, okay, well, something is positive versus negative to make it not as simple for us. And again, these are more functional studies that have kind of showed, you know, yeah, we have neutral, we have deleterious, and then we have this intermediate group. Um, and again, based on various different modalities that have been investigated, such as, you know, the lab cell survival, variant function, you see that there is this group that is not as clear cut, which may impart some risk, but not as much as um, what we typically think of with BRCA mutations. And this is work that um, is um, um, has been done over many years by uh, Dr. Fergus Couch. And again, we have him scheduled to present as our eye care expert in February, but just more of a highlight, there are variants based on much of the work he's done where they're in the intermediate range. They're not clearly benign. They're not clearly pathogenic um, based on multiple uh, different uh, ways he's looked at it. And then when we're thinking about BRCA mutations, even PRS does have the potential to spread out the risks. The risks do differ somewhat between the five prime middle and three prime end. This is um, uh, work that was published within the last few years by uh, uh, Barnes et al. And then with addition of family history of breast cancer, again, you see that the risk is also spread out. So um, both for BRCA1 as well as for BRCA2. So all that to say, I do think that things are getting more refined as we learn more and do additional studies. And then BRCA1 and 2 missense versus truncating. Again, in clinic right now, we really don't differentiate between these two types of mutations. And I'm certainly not saying that we should, but again, there is some data that's emerged that suggests that some of these risks may be different. So again, more to come on that. Uh, we had uh, presented a, or I, uh, we started working together, myself, uh, Alvaro Montero, Fergus Couch, and then our colleagues at AMBRI, led by Marcy, uh, Marcy Richardson, as well as um, Aaron Munt uh, and team at uh, Myriad. And what we did was we looked at some of these potentially hypomorphic variants across these two labs. We have a table here that I tend to refer to a lot. We have um, ones that were concordant across both labs, and then ones that were observed in one lab versus the other. But again, this is a paper that um, is currently under review. And um, again, the work is continuing. We have been awarded a grant, I guess it was last year, so it's no longer newly awarded, but Alvaro is at the helm, but both uh, doctors, Fergus Couch and myself are involved as well as our um, lab uh, laboratory-based colleagues who have been um, uh, really fantastic to work with. Now I'm talking about BRCA, 
but just uh, just to point out, this is not just a BRCA related issue. Um, as many of you have also seen with CHECK2, there are some lower penetrance uh, or reduced risk variants in CHECK2 that may not warrant the same level of care as what we typically consider um, a pathogenic CHECK2, like the 11, those um, variants in the same range of risk as 1100 del C. So again, um, CHECK2 is one of them ATM, we know of a higher penetrant variant, the C7271 T to G, there could be others as well. So again, this, the paradigm of relying on the gene to tell us the penetrance may be something that gets more complicated over time. And, you know, many of these items we have tried to highlight in um, some of our ACMG worldwide work groups that I have the list of the tremendous uh, colleagues that I work with on these efforts. We've put forth a paper on PALB2 a few years ago, CHECK2 came out, I think it was last year, and ATM should be released imminently. We have the proof, so hopefully within the next few weeks. And then the other um, efforts under development uh, we're doing one on RAD 51 C and D as well as BRIC 1, and then a points to consider document where, again, I think it's going to be increasingly important thinking about risks on a continuum. So ultimately, our goal is personal risk. We're never going to get it 100% right, but I think we can do, we're going to start doing better than what we can do right now. So kind of thinking about the gene and then overlaid with it, the mutation type, the polygenic risk score, as well as other factors that will give us a better estimate, hopefully, compared to what we typically are able to do now. Um, with that, <laughs> I think it's becoming evident that risk refinement is increasingly complex. And I do think here that communication strategies will be critical, meaning the genetic counseling that go uh, that is provided to patients that really needs to be tailored to what the risks are for that patient. So with that, I will stop and um, take any questions. So I have, I see a question in the chat. Could most all gene variants be considered hypomorph since risks may vary depending on... No, I, I, I think the point here is there are certain genes, there's certain variants that are lower than the typical risk we expect from pathogenic variants in that gene. And that's why I was trying to anchor it to, for CHECK2, it would be the 1100 LC. For a BRCA, many of the truncating variants, like they give us a risk, risks of breast cancer in the range of 60 to 70%. But there are a group where it's not necessarily complete loss of function. They're in the intermediate range. And I think that that will come out for many genes. And we've already seen that this is a growing area. Any other questions? Okay. I have another question here. In general, how strongly do you consider risk-reducing uh, THBSO for these patients? That is actually an excellent question. So right now, I would say that these risks are really focused on the breast cancer risk. We honestly don't know enough about the ovarian cancer risk. That being said, with BRCA, the risks are so high for ovarian cancer that, and we don't have any screening, the number that we kind of think about right now with, for RSO is about 5%, because I'm just really thinking PALB2 is one of those genes where we could consider RSO. So the question really remains, would we get the BRCA associated ovarian cancers below that threshold? Probably not, but that is an active area of research. 
I would not like, I would still strongly recommend RSO for these patients. To me, the main thing right now is refining the breast cancer risk management options. Um, another question, is there any data on the effectiveness of PARP inhibitors? Um, again, excellent question. Another area of active investigation. Right now, the data, to the best of my knowledge, is conflicting. So there's not anything we know for sure. There have been data that has suggested even that hypomorphs may respond better to PARP inhibitor. So again, the data is all over the place. I wouldn't, I don't think we're ready to guide or to figure, uh, to know whether PARP inhibitors are more or less effective in these individuals. So again, I don't know that right now it would change anything you did. Okay, and then I have another question here. This may be a question for next month's CANRIS, but can we expect the hypomorphs to be included in CANRIS at some point? Yes, that would be a great question for um, uh, Dr. Antonio. They are aware of it. Um, and I'll show you in my presentation, like some of the cases, you can trick the system. So what Mariah is getting at is you can't use these hypomorphs to generate risk assessments through can risk because you're gonna, like if it's a hypomorphic variant, you're gonna overestimate the risk because can risk is really designed to go with typical risks. Um, that being said, and this was actually straight from Dr. Antonio when I asked him the question about the um, hypomorphs, one way of tricking the system is to use check two instead of BRCA1 when you're dealing with a hypomorph. So at least it accounts a little bit for the risk being reduced. The problem with that though is still gonna be can risk takes into account the age distribution and a lot of other factors. So it's not a perfect solution by any means. But again, bottom line is for these atypical risk mutations, can risk is really not designed to deal with them at this point in time. Um, and then another question, uh, can consider that many non-genetics providers order testing, but do not understand hypomorphs or reduce penetrance. Uh, yes, I would agree. Again, I think one of the things we've tried to bring to do to bring more attention to this is they are included in NCCN guidelines. I 100% agree. I think this is getting more complicated. So this is why, you know, I wanted Dr. Montero to talk about this as well as, you know, we have uh, Dr. Couch also who will be talking about it. I think it will take time for folks to have increased awareness about this. But I think it is very important because it's got tremendous or potential tremendous implications to patient care. So 100% agree with you, Robin. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next case, which here is a um, uh, pedigree is 80 year old with a BRCA. Uh, one mutation of uh, German descent. And uh, there is also a brother who had prostate cancer, lung cancer, um, who was positive. So <clears throat> with this variant that was identified, again, it's the C5096G to A, what you see here, and again, if you recall, just looking at the family history, it's not super typical for a BRCA1 mutation. Um, modified analysis, 129 families, shown this variant confers intermediate risk. So another thing is, again, when we're looking at these, what I found is, like, there is no shortcut to figuring it out if this is intermediate risk or not. So I just pulled this from ClinVar, 
when we look at it on ClinVar, if it's listed as pathogenic, it may not be like fully apparent that this could be a hypomorph. So what I find useful is looking at some of the write-ups from some of the labs that we tend to use more often to see, okay, well, what, what do they have to say to clue myself in that, hey, this could be a different one, especially if the write-up from the testing lab that I got doesn't necessarily fully tell me this. Um, this is another resource that I use, canvaruk.org, which again, you can see here, they're listing it as pathogenic, giving you some additional information about the variant. Um, the other thing I mentioned that we'd done this poster um, presentation in Montreal, I've found this poster to be very useful when I go back to look at these uh, hypomorphic variants because we actually had a table where we included the concordant ones as well as the ones that were tested in one lab. So again, this one is one that both Ambry and Myriad are calling hypomorphic. This is a paper that should be out in the next few months, it's under review. So again, I think we've covered some of this, but how do we counsel and manage this patient who's probably got a hypomorphic variant? Um, association of this mutation with breast and ovarian cancer are all that's been done, but like, what are the other cancer risks? Um, we actually, during, uh, this is uh, one of our patients at Vanderbilt, and we talked about it during one of our internal clinical meetings, and we have an internal database that um, some of our uh, faculty can search, and we have three patients with this mutation, all had either breast or ovarian cancer. Again, does that tell us that much? Not really, but it's interesting. So right now, we're planning to screen family uh, family members with this mutation per the NCCN guidelines, because uh, again, I think that there is data that's lacking, but again, I think this is where the field is going, where with time, I am hopeful that we will get more guidance um, through the various guidelines. Um, so it... Great question. When we're talking about BRCA1 and BRCA2, when I mention hypomorphic, yes, generally that's a moderate penetrance. But Robin makes a great point. Hypomorphic is not the same. So, you know, maybe a better term. And I think this is what has been nationally recommended to use reduced penetrant variant. So if it's a BRCA1 or BRCA2, reduced penetrant variant, usually it's in the moderate range. If it's a check two reduced penetrance variant, which is usually, you know, regular check two mutations are moderate. So then it goes to the low range, but that is an excellent point. That's an excellent question. Any other questions? I'm gonna go on to the third case. Okay, so this is a 40-year-old female referred for a BRCA2 positive result. Um, again, history is she had stage one breast cancer, ERPR positive, just status post bilateral mastectomy, uh, margins weren't clear, so she was given radiation treatment, and she subsequently had a total abdominal hysterectomy, as well as a bilateral cephalopharectomy. And you can see here her family tree, here she is. And um, with through family testing, we see that her father um, carries a mutation. Interestingly, uh, uncle is negative, but uncle's daughter has a breast cancer at age 35. So again, we can't even count this breast cancer um, as being associated with this uh, BRCA2 mutation. And again, I know there are a lot of men in the family. So this is a patient that was tested through Ambry. 
Um, this is the specific uh, mutation, 631 plus 2T to G. Um, and on the report, uh, what they said is some variability in penetrance, meaning this could be a reduced penetrance variant. And again, you see some of the language that was used. Again, when you look it up on ClinVar, it's really not obvious. You have to read in order to see that, hey, this is not necessarily a straightforward uh, variant. So it is considered a probable hypomorph due to its identification in multiple biallelic Fanconi anemia patients. Um, RNA didn't show aberrant splicing. Functional studies from the literature did show that cells with this alteration reta retained substantial homology-directed DNA repair function. Um, and it's been seen over 100 times in the lab. So again, there are additional details about this variant, but doesn't necessarily tell us what we should be doing. So again, she's already status post the bilateral mastectomy, the risk-reducing selfing ovarectomy. We don't have to worry about her children yet. They're too young. Um, so I'm going to see her back. Um, and hopefully I will have more to share with her when I see her back. Family history, as I already mentioned, is limited because it's coming from the paternal lineage who are all brothers. There's very few women in that lineage. Um, and then with pancreatic cancer screening, this is another question uh, that arises. Right now, we just changed our guidelines to say that um, anyone with a BRCA2 mutation um, could consider pancreatic cancer screening. So again, I would say in this case, I would not do anything differently, but because we don't know if hypomorphic mutations predispose less to any of the other cancer types, as was brought up with ovarian cancer. I don't know what's going on with pancreatic cancer. So again, I'm hopeful that there will, this area of research will continue to grow so that we can address uh, more of these important questions. Um, any questions about this uh, prior case? Because I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm just going to keep going. So I'm excited to have uh, um, to talk about our upcoming case conferences. Like I already mentioned, uh, Antonis Antonio will be our guest expert during our November Eye Care Case Conference uh, focused on can risk please, please, please submit cases that you want discussed with Antonis. I have some that I've prepared that I would love to discuss, but I would certainly put aside mine if others have cases they'd like to discuss um, where you run the can risk and it doesn't necessarily make sense. Because again, what I've found in the past is talking it through with Antonis is super helpful in terms of guiding us to better to be better equipped to talk to our patients about these risk assessments. And um, in December, we have um, uh, Dr. Laura Thompson, who is a psychologist with specific expertise in um, seeing patients with hereditary cancer. Laura was someone that I had worked with back when I was at Moffitt, and she is really phenomenal. So again, if you have any cases where you want to highlight or ask about psychosocial issues and consequences of her uh, hereditary cancer diagnosis, please submit them. And again, um, Laura is very, very insightful. Um, I have a question here. What resources for details do you consider? Um, articles in ClinVar, talking to labs. Uh, yeah, all of the above, Robin. I, I find the detail section in ClinVar particularly useful just to kind of scan it to see if there are any red flags that come up. What I will also say is sometimes with these hypomorphic variants, there will be conflicting interpretations. The ones I showed you, that wasn't the case, but if you see conflicting interpretation, that is a red flag that maybe there is something different going on with this mutation. And maybe it is a 
hypomorph. So that those are the things that I usually will do. You can even scan it. Like I was saying, even though on ClinVar, it may say pathogenic or likely pathogenic, if you look at the actual submissions and how they reported it out, it can be discordant. In the past, they would call this conflicting interpretation. So I don't know what is going on in ClinVar. I was going to look into that further regardless, but yeah, I think just looking, just scanning some of the other reports is not a bad idea. Um, and again, the, we have, we've started our lineup for next year um, for our eye care case conferences, but I would encourage you all to submit ideas. If there is something in particular you want to hear about, let me know and we will try and accommodate it. I mentioned that we have our ATM uh, paper through ACMG coming out soon. So we will likely have an ATM focused case conference as well, as well as a RAD 51C, RAD 51D, BRIP1 case conference that Helen has uh, agreed to lead in October. So more to come on that, but please provide your ideas. We're happy to try and accommodate. So with that, I know we're done a little bit early. I thank you for attending and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.